in an eagle scout. I don't, I, I don't make any jokes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm okay with being referred to as the county's uh, Boy Scout and working to be prepared uh, because uh, that's what we do. But I would like to uh, focus, and again, uh, just a, just an alibi here. Um, I've not updated this uh, presentation since last week uh, with Adelia that was uh, that drove by us, and certainly uh, things we can talk about uh, there uh, as that storm, uh, you know, paralleled our coast. But let me jump right into some of the hurricane discussion a little bit, and we want to review with everyone if I can make sure this will advance. Um, making sure that we kind of revisit with everybody our hazards and our dangers uh, that are here. And no doubt, a couple of things that we experienced with Adelia and then certainly what we have seen on the news with our, our family and friends. Um, you know, we, we make the joke a little bit here about it's not uh, that the wind is blowing, but it's what the wind might be blowing. And uh, we continue to hold that mantra that we want you to hide from the wind and run from the water. And in the events that we've had here uh, with water and particularly uh, the storm surge inundation, that's what we worry about. Um, oftentimes the public forgets that a cubic yard of seawater weighs over a ton. So when you start adding water movement uh, like that, you know that some problems can occur. And uh, we're very fortunate in Southwest Florida to have seen uh, you know, the improved building codes that go all the way back to post-Hurricane Andrew in 1992. So um, any of you that have been in construction or, or, or been challenged by the building code official, it's these storm events where you give that little victory lap uh, to the building code official because we built a little bit stronger and a little bit better. Um, you know, we, we talk about the wind speeds, the different categories, and I think the whole world has kind of figured that out by now. But we always have a little bit of uh, area of caution in that we can have a category one or category two storm event with the correct angle of approach, and that really will move some water onto our coastline. And as we saw this week or last week with Adelia, that remember we had a parallel storm event we had some onshore flow and we had king tide or an astronomical high tide. And as a result, we saw a fair amount of localized flooding. So uh, we don't want to uh, relate necessarily the category of the storm to the storm surge, as I've just illustrated. Uh, but again, it does give us a little bit of a marker, uh, at least uh, for reference. Um, everybody knows a little bit of the anatomy of the, of the hurricane event and uh, the hurricane formation. And as you have mentioned, uh, and it's certainly been on the mind of every coastal emergency manager uh, in these last couple of years is monitoring sea surface temperature, uh, gulf surface temperature, and even some of the uh, deeper waters where we've seen the high temps. I think the thing that took my breath away uh, this last week or two was some of the uh, record temperatures recorded, sea surface temperatures recorded uh, in the Keys as well as the impact on the coral. Uh, to me, that was quite, uh, that was quite profound. Um, besides the hazards, um, you know, we, we talk a little bit and we, we experienced this last week with the tornado activity. Um, now, we were fortunate and tornadoes are rare in Southwest Florida but they're, they're rare in that they don't make, uh, they don't touch down too often, or they may be uh, kind of spawning from uh, water spout events. And as you all may recall, we had a lot of tornado warnings during Idelia because they were spotted by radar over in Miami. Now, the good news is that we got a lot of those warnings. Uh, those, uh, every time a polygon changes, a new warning goes out and that's the right thing to do, although it may even be considered a little frustrating, but we want to um, make sure that those warnings are going through and they're generated not at the local level, but by the National Weather Service. And we are at a little bit of a disadvantage because the radar uh, equipment is located in Miami and the curvature of the earth doesn't necessarily get a very close picture of local radar 
but we did see some of those radar signatures uh, during that particular um, storm event. So a little trivia here, how many tornadoes were spawned during Hurricane Ivan in 2004? 120. So when you have this unstable atmosphere, atmospheric conditions, these uh, wind bands, uh, lots of crazy things can happen and we'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, let's move on and Ian in 2022, uh, 70 different uh, radar signatures were indicated during the tornadic activity. So again, when we talk about sheltering in place, monitoring local radio and television, hiding from the water, getting into substantial structure, obviously uh, we have a cause uh, to make sure that that continues to happen. Inland flooding, um, you know, obviously these hazards are there between the down power lines, the debris, the insects, uh, the reptiles. Uh, and remember in South Florida, we're incredibly flat. Uh, so we get sheet flow in our, uh, uh, you know, in our rural areas. Um, so that too can be a problem. Um, we continue in the county level to work very closely with South Florida Water Management District in a constant uh, uh, effort going on here to make sure that drainage systems, uh, as we continue to you know, produce more impervious surface, we've got more runoff. And so uh, the county works hard on its stormwater program. We don't have an infinite number of dollars uh, but every available dollar is used to keep that water moving uh, safely and moving appropriately and, and being environmentally friendly uh, in that uh, process. Um, Hurricane Ian, uh, again, uh, moves some substantial amounts of water, as you see from these pictures, uh, well inland. I live off of Immokalee Road near uh, North uh, Naples Community Hospital, North, North uh, Naples Community North. NCH North and, uh, you know, in my neighborhood, I uh, had some incredible uh, flood levels there with the water backing up in the Coquihatchee. So again, uh, not only do we have to pay attention to the wind, but we certainly have to pay attention in the flooding. Um, storm surge, uh, you all have seen this video locally uh, numerous times. Uh, the jury has been out on whether or not people were in this particular home uh, I'm not sure this video will play in this environment. Maybe it will. But you all have seen this uh, time-lapse uh, video uh, of Fort Myers Beach in this particular home. Uh, the thing I will highlight is, uh, fortunately, no one was hurt uh, in this particular uh, storm surge uh, inundation that occurred that moved this home off of the foundation. And uh, I think we have finally communicated to the public uh, in, in a rather dramatic way uh, our concern for storm surge inundation and the power. And, and part of this also, too, is convincing people that they don't have to evacuate to Kansas. Uh, you know, just going a few miles inland uh, will take care of what most of their needs are uh, during that evacuation. So. Uh, again, really uh, gut-wrenching uh, video here, but uh, proves that point about onshore, onshore flow uh, onto uh, Southwest Florida. Um, the negative storm surge, oops, let me, uh, wrong button, so sorry. So in the negative storm surge, uh, at that same time, this was some pictures of water that uh, was sucked out, pulled out of Tampa Bay which I thought was incredibly uh, interesting as well. And again, trying to make sure folks understand what that right quadrant uh, does as it relates to uh, storm surge inundation. So we talk about emergency planning uh, and, you know, um, we're all creatures of uh, habit or creatures of procrastination. And we really do need the general public uh, to be better prepared. Um, we know nationally that uh, so many families have a minimal amount of funds in reserve. Uh, we know that a lot of families are uh, living paycheck to paycheck, and we want to continue to find ways to find families uh, or to help families and businesses uh, stay more uh, disaster resilient. 
when we talk about shelters and evacuation shelters, uh, <laughs> our little our little uh, catchphrase is that our shelters are a lifeboat, not the love boat. Um, you know, they are just refuge uh, locations, and we try to provide as many supplies and materials and comfort items as we can, but uh, very few of these locations have uh, backup power. Very few have backup power that uh, is supported or will support air conditioning. Uh, we remind folks to come fully prepared to these evacuation shelters. And we're very thankful, very blessed of the partnership that Collier County government has with Collier County schools to help staff these because there are no volunteer resources in Southwest Florida, such as Red Cross to man uh, pre-landfall uh, shelter uh, locations. So we have made a lot of accommodations to make middle schools pet friendly. Um, our pet friendly schools are self-service uh, pet friendly. Uh, we don't have staff, uh, animal control folks. We just don't have enough employees in the region to go around to provide pet care. So Everyone uh, needs to come self-sufficient, uh, not only for themselves, but for their pets uh, as well. Um, timing in these storm events, um, this is probably the hardest thing that I do, is uh, attempt to sequence, <coughs> pardon me, to kind of sequence our local state of emergency, our evacuation discussions, our shelter openings, our uh, uh, adjustment in county government activities, and then be ready for uh, the storm event and the response. So it is my job to sequence those things. Um, it is not my job to uh, close schools um, or do anything else with any other local government other than Collier County. Uh, in a home rule state, Marco, Naples, Everglades City, school district, independent fire districts, they make their own operational decisions. My decisions or my recommendations rather go to the county manager for action only for the unincorporated area of uh, Collier County. Um, we continue to stress safe rooms uh, and reminding people where to go indoors uh, if they can have that opportunity outside of the storm surge area to shelter in place. Uh, we do pay very close attention to our um, uh, manufactured homes and our mobile home parks uh, to make sure that if they are frail and elderly, uh, we can uh, coach them on what to do or otherwise uh, find, find a location with family and friends uh, well inland. You know, um, again, we can't emphasize enough run from the water and uh, hide from the wind. Our evacuation zones in Collier County uh, are now simply referred to as A, B, C, and D. Uh, and that's really coming, uh, your A zone is everything south and west of US 41. And ironically, a lot of our roadways become pretty natural geographical boundaries. On average, and, and again, this is average before Collier County was developed, you know, our elevation only increases about one foot per mile inland. Now, granted, we have paved uh, things, we have elevated things, we have drainage ditches, but the bathymetry of our coast certainly makes us uh, storm surge susceptible. Before the storm, um, I think the most challenging thing in this document, in, in this slide rather, is reminding folks to take pictures. Um, date time stamped pictures of your home, your contents, your pre-event conditions, and certainly your insurance. And uh, I'm a homeowner. I, play, I pay flood insurance. And, uh, you know, like all of us, we're really kind of holding our breath here to kind of see what happens uh, to homeowners insurance. We know FEMA flood 2.0 is already going to generate um, an escalated flood, uh, flood um, premiums going up substantially or going up uh, strategically in the years to come uh, at, but due to the uh, amount of underwriting that the federal government has had to do for uh, FEMA flood. 
Um, we can't, we always seem to find folks that um, really have not packed very well. Uh, and we want to remind them about their supplies, their cash, uh, batteries, one gallon per person per day for water to drink, four gallons per person uh, per day uh, to sustain uh, kind of a day-to-day -day, uh, routine. So again, reminding everyone uh, about papers and supplies, documentation, re-entry into an area, having some documentation of your uh, particular residence. Um, all of those uh, shelf-stable supplies, taking care of the family, the friends, the pets, uh, and making sure that you have more than one form of identification with you at all times is certainly important. And I'm probably giving you all a headache here, but let me move through these pretty quickly. Um, in the emergency plan, uh, you know, we, we, we're we surprised and a lot of the folks that we speak with uh, get a little uh, wrapped around the axle. Oh, my cell phone doesn't work. My landline doesn't work. And, you know, texting uh, is a resource with our wireless devices today that is actually pretty robust and takes very little bandwidth in discussions. And we encourage folks to set up texting uh, groups with family and friends. Usually those messages will go through about where you're evacuating, where you're going, are you, are you okay? And then finally, we're very blessed in this community with the support with our nonprofits. Um, there's only so much that county government and FEMA and state government can do. And our nonprofit organizations here are absolutely have incredibly uh, really stepped up uh, in this Hurricane Ian recovery issues. And uh, these storm events, as, as I have done so many, are so incredibly life changing uh, for so many people. And when you mentioned resiliency at the beginning of your discussion, you know, we're in that resiliency team as well. And uh, we hate to see the impacts that a lot of our families and friends uh, go through. Utility outages, uh, always a problem. Um, we, uh, we have a lot of worry about portable generators. Uh, we have seen deaths in our region uh, from the improper use of portable generators, uh, but our working relationship with Florida Power and Light and Lee Co-op is excellent and they continue to work really hard to help build resiliency uh, in their network. And um, uh, again, a lot going on with them. And a lot of equipment um, as a result of Hurricane Ian is going to continue to fail over the years, especially where it was inundated with saltwater or saltwater infiltration into a lot of pad transformers and those kind of things. Uh, that's going to cost FPNL a lot of money because they are going to fail sooner than later. Uh, but FPNL has certainly had their focus on getting life back to normal. And uh, if these periodic outages occur, uh, they'll respond uh, accordingly. Um, debris removal, um, a huge, huge expense. Um, and our, our biggest uh, challenge here is to remind the public how to sort uh, their debris and just millions of dollars and millions of cubic yards of, of debris of all types that has to be processed differently. Um, and FEMA in, is so intense on this process. Collier County has been a leader in the debris removal uh, program, uh, really has been recognized a couple of times for best practices. Uh, but um, it is also the federal government's big, biggest expense. And about 35 cents of every dollar that FEMA puts into debris removal is gone into, goes into rather debris removal monitoring uh, to make sure that loads are accurate, properly uh, transported, properly sorted, et cetera. So the debris mission alone it is, is really a huge, under, uh, a huge undertaking uh, for us. Um, I'm going to assume that, uh, Bridget, I'm doing okay. You coached me here on time. I'm going to zip right through here. But uh, again, we restress uh, and reemphasize our evacuation zones. Alert Collier, 
Alert Collier is our mass notification system. And we understand a few folks got a lot of alerts during Idalia. And uh, we want to remind them that, remember, if you register with Alert Collier, you can turn on or turn off the devices or the number of warnings that you want to receive. However, uh, there are some warnings that will always go through and are not originated by Collier County, and that is tornado warning and hurricane warning. Uh, so you're going to get, if, if those things uh, surface on our radar, uh, yes, you will get uh, a lot of notifications. It's also important in your contact list to put this Collier County alert Collier 239-252-8000 so you don't blow off this call and we can uh, we want you to hear it and more importantly it's going to keep calling you if you don't acknowledge uh, that you received that call so lots of capability of the alert caller I, I will share with you that there's a little um, there are a lot of pieces in that mass notification system and one of those puzzle pieces is the accuracy of the data that goes, uh, that is provided by carriers such as T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T. And uh, we experienced and reported a few problems with uh, T-Mobile's database uh, during, her, during this last event, during Adelia, uh, where T-Mobile's database picked up a few neighborhoods in New York. So we're not really sure, but we've asked T-Mobile uh, to look into that, maybe some uh, software coding issues. Our 311 service in Collier County, tons of information. We keep that live and fresh during a storm event. So if you download that 311 app, you know you have a lot of information. We do a pretty good job. Uh, we don't saturate uh, social media too much during blue skies, but we do put enough information out there to keep, your, uh, keep you interested, keep you informed. Uh, as we go into severe weather or other major emergency events. We rely heavily on our media partners uh, and our no weather radio, uh, which is, an, uh, again, another uh, great tool. Um, our website has an emergency homepage that we do a great job of refreshing. And we have a little button there where it says make a report. And we have some self-reporting damage assessment tools and that is a tremendous help to us to let us know if you've had property damage or localized flooding, or you can even report a street flooding in there. And uh, we're a big county, and the more eyes that we have from the community, the more information we have, uh, the better we can uh, respond. We, have, uh, we partner with Florida Department of Health for a special needs client registry. Uh, and again, we provide some essential services for those who are electrically dependent, oxygen dependent, or transportation dependent for basic medical care. And uh, we have about 700 clients in that database, and we have an entire task force dedicated to uh, trying to provide the essential services for those frail and elderly during times of disaster. And we have a great uh, team that does that. Um, one thing that we did in Hurricane Ian that we continue to see great success with is using the social media site Crisis Cleanup. And if your home was impacted and you're not able to uh, provide a, uh, get a contractor or you have some insurance challenges, Crisis Cleanup is a social media site uh, operated by a nonprofit group in California, and you can request assistance and volunteer groups uh, align themselves with those work orders that uh, pop up in crisis cleanup. And we've been working with them now for a couple of years and we find that to be a good forum. The sales tax holiday we just went through. And uh, just a few more things real quick. Obviously we know a little bit about our history. We know what can happen uh, pre-season, <laughs> season and post-season. Um, so we know that Southwest Florida is certainly open uh, to those challenges. There was our Ian timeline, and uh, I think it was interesting in the discussion between September 25th and 27th, 
um, we've sent out 36 different notifications about watch, warning, and evacuation. So between radio, television, NOAA weather radio, social media, and mass notification systems, uh, you know, we really uh, worked hard to get the information to everyone uh, in the community as best that we possibly could. Um, our EN response had a tremendous logistics uh, lift um, with uh, thousands of cots, uh, muck out kits, pallets of water. Uh, during Hurricane uh, Irma, we transloaded 63 tractor trailer loads of FEMA and state supplies and got that out to the community. Ian was a little lighter load with 23 tractor trailer loads of supplies, not counting what came from other nonprofit groups, uh, Baptist Men, Salvation Army, et cetera. So uh, here at our facility, we have a really good plan uh, for logistics capability to try to get those supplies out. And a little bit of trivia during the COVID outbreak, um, not one it. agency, not one agency in Carter County uh, ran out of PPE. Uh, we did 1.8 million pieces of PPE distribution here to 80, over 80 well, go in. in uh, Carter County. Huh? Uh, the debris removal uh, load there was substantial. So I'll just let you look at those numbers. It's just fine. Oh, good. good. Sorry, Dan. Uh, Lorraine, can you mute your microphone, please? Sorry, we're getting your um, background noise. Maybe she doesn't hear me. Okay, sorry, Dan. Go That's okay. Uh, there we go. And so just to let you know of, of uh, some of the loads of debris and, and uh, the, the volume there that we uh, engaged in was pretty incredible. Um, I was very impressed uh, with our FEMA support, despite the fact that they were short of manpower with concurrent disasters. Uh, $37 million uh, from FEMA went out in rental assistance, $14 million in other assistance. Um, and I know we had close to 33,000 people register for FEMA assistance in Collier County alone. Uh, we ran uh, numerous disaster recovery uh, registration centers. Um, although FEMA was a little shorthanded, but we strategically moved those uh, recovery centers around and over $90 million in SBA disaster loans was made available. So uh, we did an awful lot of work to uh, an ongoing coordination months after the event to give everyone an opportunity to uh, make it as convenient as possible to seek uh, some FEMA assistance. Um, in our residential uh, damage was fortunately uh, not too bad but our immediate coastal area obviously uh, took the bulk of that from uh, Naples proper on up towards uh, Vanderbilt uh, Beach. Um, and we'll just kind of wrap up here a little bit. Uh, certainly the predictions for this year that are up uh, on this particular presentation, and uh, we'll see what the rest of the season looks like. Uh, September 12th is considered the peak day uh, of hurricane season in Southwest Florida. And uh, we're certainly counting the days till December the 1st and hope that we don't have any more challenges and make sure that we're as a community uh, being as resilient as we can and certainly working as a community uh, really is what, uh, what is important. An important takeaway is that we remind folks not to look at the cone or the little black line, uh, but anything within the cone and around the cone is fair game uh, for storm impacts. And uh, we know that uh, South Florida uh, can certainly have some interesting uh, things that occur. I'm not gonna go into the storm surge discussion from the National Weather Service, uh, pretty good basic understanding there of storm surge. So I will stop right here, uh, Bridget, and um, see how we're doing on time. And I want to leave an opportunity for some questions and, and further discussion. Thank you, Dan. That's perfect. Yeah, we have time. Um, it's only 1240 right now. So we will have time for questions. And that was a, an excellent presentation.
presentation with lots of new information, I think, and resources that are really important to have on hand um, in the case that we would need them this year or in the future. Um, so I saw a question from Julia Herbst about where does the debris go? Do you want to, oh, if everyone wants to unmute yourselves and turn on your camera so we can see who's on, that's great. Um, and if you want to just ask a question, I see Sandy has her hand raised. Um, so to talk a little bit about debris, thank you. It's a great question. And as again, I mentioned, it is a huge undertaking. Um, it is a process that uh, we hire contractors to do a very competitive uh, contract. And it is a very much a unique skill set um, to manage these storm debris properly. Um, we have um, a great track record with several firms that, have, that are experienced in this. It, I will share with you that um, the number of storms, tornadoes, and things going on in the country, um, the, the manpower and the equipment for these storm responses, uh, during Hurricane Irma, we had debris removal trucks uh, from Oregon. Uh, that just goes to show you that uh, folks in the southeast and southwest of uh, Florida who might be in this line of business were had so much work to do. So the contracting went all the way uh, to the to the uh, west coast of the U.S. Where does the debris go? So this is part of the sorting process. Hurricane uh, Wilma, for example, was generated more vegetative debris. Hurricane uh, Ian uh, generated more construction and demolition debris. So vegetative debris uh, goes is one haul, it is one load, if you will, and that goes to a processing site where that is um, volume reduction takes place and that is ground up basically into mulch. And uh, FEMA does allow us uh, several options uh, we can keep that mulch for public uh, parks. Uh, in many cases, we generate so much that we're actually authorized. Uh, we don't make any money off of it. It's a, an accounting trade, but we are actually authorized to sell that as boiler fuel. Uh, there are some companies that will buy it and burn it. Um, and uh, depending on, uh, you know, whether it's got a lot of sand or other debris in it, and otherwise, it goes to a landfill. But we try to recycle that and repurpose that wherever possible. Things like refrigerators and appliances, the refrigerant has to be removed. That, too, is an assembly line process that's managed at a debris staging area. And once the refrigerant and the oils are removed from those appliances, they are crushed. And that scrap metal is typically uh, recycled. Construction debris, uh, where possible, concrete and block also goes through volume reduction uh, for possible repurposing. And then finally, there's regular garbage. And that regular garbage, uh, depending on the volume, uh, we have an option of sending that to a, another landfill, uh, uh, sometimes referred to as a hazardous materials landfill. Uh, and it's trucked, and FEMA pays for that, or we have the option to take it. Um, and uh, again, depending on what we have for capacity, most of these storm events, we have elected to transport it to a landfill outside of Collier County uh, to avoid uh, unnecessary waste and uh, losing our landfill capacity. And then finally, hazardous materials, those two have to be sorted. And uh, if they can't be sorted, anything that uh, or sorted or separated, uh, then that does go to a hazardous materials uh, landfill, especially lined landfill. And I believe the one we use this year um, under, uh, with all of the state review and EPA guidance uh, was the uh, Okeechobee uh, hazardous waste landfill. So it, it is, uh, it's, it's a process and a lot of work and uh, we do it, uh, it's a lot of work and we're very responsible in that process. 
Thanks, Dan. That's great. Um, Sandy, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, Dan, you mentioned the um, continued strengthening of building codes over the last period of time. Uh, and this is sort of a personal question, but I live in a um, seven story building that was completed within the last well, probably three years ago, two years ago. And the question is, um, with Adalia, we got a notice about uh, move into an interior room. Is that guidance hold for everybody, regardless of the building code under which your building was built? It really does. And so uh, here's why. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, you can have, it's not very common, but you don't want to play with that factor. You could have uh, a tornadic activity that puts a little different uh, stress on your windows. And so as a result of that, it, you know, the, there is that blanket order to go to interior hallways, interior corridors, away from glass, even if you're in a, let's say you've got hurricane windows, you've got hurricane glass. Um, so again, it is that blanket order, uh, regardless of the building type, uh, you know, we even go through some of that discussion here and this building is a category five rated building. Uh, where we're, now we don't have much glass, uh, but again, it's not uncommon for us to issue that order and it's not uncommon for HOAs to say, hey, the policy is going to be, if we're under that tornado watch or warning, stay away from the glass, uh, take shelter in interior corridors to the extent possible. Call it more, call it as much tradition as anything else. And just to follow up then, uh, is there a similar notice that says, okay, you can get out of the bathroom now? Yeah, and so this is something we've continued to discuss with the National Weather Service about what is an all clear. And there were no all clears given. And the difference is this, when you get these tornado warnings, under a hurricane event where a band of wind or, you know, we're getting these bands through, there is reluctancy by the weather service to give you an all clear because they can't give you an all clear for your street when that band of wind is a couple of miles down the road or the weather is still unstable. So in the hurricane event, there. To, and again, under discussion is when can we say that that atmosphere is stable enough that you've got an all clear? So we don't want to, so they're just very cautious about that. In our average garden variety thunderstorm, okay, when the thunderstorm is over, your tornado threat is over. But in this un unstable atmosphere, Let's say we give you an all clear, you had a band come through. There was a radar signature, the tornado warning went out. If they give you an all clear, you're gonna think, well, I'm all done. Well, 20 minutes later, here comes another band, another trailing band that can do the same thing. So I don't know if you'll see an all clear in these hurricane events come up or not because it is such a dynamic weather environment until that storm clears. It's a little frustrating. Yeah, thank you though. Okay, then I saw we had a question in the chat box, I think from Courtney, and then we'll do Katie's question after that one. Um, go ahead. Oh, Courtney's question was, what was the biggest obstacle um, during Hurricane Ian about the recovery process? Well, I think a couple of things that are, you know, every, <laughs> I, um, every storm gives you a different challenge and, you know, the, the vulnerability in the community or, you know, what resources are available at local, state or federal level. I think one of the challenges during Ian, uh, again, was how far, um, uh, well, first of all, the number of counties that were impacted during Ian, 
was quite a challenge. The number of states that were impacted by other concurrent disasters was a strain on the federal system. And even the private sector, as I mentioned, uh, had to recruit debris uh, hauling equipment from the west coast of the, you know, from Oregon and California. And that took a little time to mobilize. So I think a lot of these, uh, you, you know, you think, okay, well, there's plenty of dump trucks and front end loaders and knuckle boom loaders and those kind of things. And you find out very quickly that when you've got, um, in the case of Hurricane Ian, you had 37 counties in Florida declared at one time. There are 37 counties looking for thousands of dump trucks and debris removal equipment. And so that particular challenge was it just took um, time for our contractors uh, to mobilize, and we were all getting a little bit impatient. Um, you know, FPNL had, uh, I don't know what the number was, over 10,000 people working for power restoration. And so we all want those things uh, fixed quickly, but we very, uh, it's very easy to forget that, um, you know, we're not in this alone and we've got millions of people impacted. So the obstacle really is resource management during every one of these events. All right, and then we have Katie. Let me see. Yes, th thank you for that presentation. Um, I was curious with the county ramping up its vulnerability assessment efforts, um, how has there been any strategies discussed on how to incorporate all this great data from the emergency management and um, lessons learned and, and how to get that and account for that in the countywide vulnerability assessment? Yeah, so there, there, those assessments kind of have two flavors. Uh, and let me explain what I mean by that. The, the way we look at it is this. The, the vulnerability for me is your crisis responder or your consequence responder means that I'm paying attention to vulnerability impacts, okay? Impacts on housing, construction, uh, recovery, and those type of things. The second flavor that I look at is really our resiliency in long term. And our resiliency in long term goes back to land use planning. It goes back in my mind to uh, vertical construction, uh, floodplain elevation, and those things that make a reasonable uh, approach to retrofit. Um, we love old Florida. We love uh, our beaches. We have well-established homes at grade. And so they are always going to have some level of vulnerability until it becomes reasonable or cost beneficial to replace those uh, homes, for example, with elevated construction. Now, what I think Collier County has done, and, and having come from coastal North Carolina, where, you know, we got whacked an awful lot before I came here. You know, what I think, when I say victory goes to the building code official, victory is the fact that, you know, we are going through some of that painful uh, elevation discussions and the additional floodplain regulations and those kind of things. So there's the resiliency flavor that says, okay, either, we make an immediate retrofit as one example, or we start down the avenue of stronger codes, more elevation. On my side of the house, because I'm not regulatory, on my side of the house, what I'm continuing to do locally is build local capability. So in that local capability is more shelters, more generators, more, more life support, more uh, critical needs transportation assets. So um, I get both sides. Um, I know both sides of the house and the county's uh, uh, resiliency office is in our growth management division, which again, that is our code official, that's our land use planning. So that's that side of the resiliency. My side of the resiliency is 
making sure that I can build more local capability to respond more frequently and to respond with greater demands for service. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, thanks for asking that question, Katie. <laughs> I was interested in that. Oh, and I see Sandy's hand back up again. Yes, thanks. Um, we know that the county has a list of unfunded projects that's millions and millions of dollars worth, and they will be making decisions uh, soon about what the property tax millage rate should be for the coming year. I'm just curious to know um, if your projects are anywhere in that list of unfunded and um, to what extent, um, I don't want to ask this in a way that you're <laughs> I'm going to put you in a box, but I'm just curious uh, about how the millage rate uh, that the county uh, decides to go with uh, affects uh, what you're able to do. All right. Thank you. Yes, and and for a department head, that's always that's all <laughs> that's always the with the palms start get sweaty when. That, but it's a great question, and I would share this to say that um, I have been incredibly fortunate with the Board of County Commissioners and their support for public safety overall. Um, I, I'm not going to tell you I have everything that I need, but uh, they have been very supportive to either help me find a path for a critical need or my team has worked incredibly hard uh, to leverage FEMA funds for grant opportunities uh, that are pre and post disaster. And FEMA also has a little bit of money that's passed through to local emergency managers. So I generally I'm doing okay. Um, you know, but what I do think about in some of these unfunded mandates, um, again, is just making sure that uh, we take really good care of our infrastructure. We take good care of our buildings uh, because we may need those for an alternate purpose uh, in post disaster. And, um, you know, I wish we could afford generators everywhere, but we can't. Uh, uh, we just can't uh, put that on the rate payer necessarily for water or sewer in every environment. Uh, but we continue to take seriously, and I think the county takes seriously, my emergency management mission. And generally, I have been pretty well supported, and uh, I have been able to expand our planning and, and staff capability without having to rely on grant funds just to sustain basic planning and operational positions. And I'm in a lot better shape than a lot of counties uh, because I don't have to have any grants necessarily to keep lights on. I use the grants to buy shelter supplies and equipment and generators and those type of things right now. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thanks so much. And I'm seeing that it is 1259. So we had this scheduled from 12 to 1, but I do see a really interesting question in the chat box. So I don't know. I know some folks need to go, but I see something that Rebecca Bixer wrote with larger storms due to higher temps, increasing construction and population. To what extent do you think Southwest Florida can adapt to these increasing risks? So it's a adaptation question and I don't know if you have a sort of short sure answer for that Dan or if you guys well, want to I, I, I do and, and you know uh, uh, finally I mean it took FEMA a little while to kind of really make a decision to sort of recognize climate change and and in those impacts and so here here's where I, I put that very briefly number one it is about continuing to build resiliency with a, a, a you know, just a whole host of strategies. That's okay to, to think smarter uh, and, and, and put preparedness out there and put resiliency out there. And so again, I'm working every day to be better prepared at a newer level. And then the increasing risk, which is not anything we're gonna fix overnight, it's a multi-year strategy and we're gonna have to take it, you know, one bite at a time to find ways, do we expand our stormwater? Do we elevate construction? Do we do our make our lift stations a little higher? 
And so all of those type of things are a building block. It you know, took us a lot of years to get here. It's going to take a lot of years to adapt. And I just say that we, we put a uh, common sense approach to paper and we go after it. And uh, it, it's unfortunately not anything we're going to fix overnight, but we just keep working at it and, and work to keep building resiliency and, and, and we'll be, hopefully, if we're smart, we'll be uh, a little less financially impact, less financially impacted in the future and certainly have less toll uh, on our community. Right, so just um, doing, yes, some different building and um, those sort of things. Did you have any follow-up questions to that, Rebecca? I see you're still on. Um, I have about 10 questions I could ask Dan, so I don't know um, if you have a chance to, for a follow-up call later, that would be great. Um, but yeah, really, just thank you so much for the work that you do, and I, I have done some research on disaster risk communication. I'm an urban planner and have worked with FEMA and the floodplain mapping, and I just think all of this work is really challenging, and, and so far, Florida, I think, is doing a great job. Um, it's tough work, and so thanks for thanks for your presentation today, and thanks for your work. Thank you very much. I appreciate the support. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, that was such a good summary, Rebecca. I'm going to follow with. Um, thank you all for attending. And thanks so much, Dan. There was so much great information here. And um, I hope it's OK if folks, you know, reach out to you if they have other questions or. Um, sure. Yeah, is that OK? So we will be posting up the video on our website, like I said, and I'll also write up a little summary with some of the links you shared and resources. I really like some of the apps that you mentioned. So we'll make sure that comes out in our next newsletter, um, which I hope you're all signed up for. Uh, and you'll have um, access to that. And um, with that, I just wanna say have a great afternoon and hopefully we'll see you at the next um, October workshop. Thank you all. Enjoyed it. My pleasure. Have a good day. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.